Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm Mark Zitter, chair of the Zetima Project, a member of the club's board of governors and your moderator for today. This is another program in the club's special virtual series on the coronavirus in association with the Zetima Project. Next Friday, April 24th at 2 p.m. Pacific, we'll host Pandemic Healthcare Inequities and How They Affect Everyone with the CEOs of Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, Martin Luther King Jr. Community Hospital, and LA Care Health Plan. On May 4th at noon Pacific, we will hear Kaiser Family Foundation CEO Drew Altman discuss US healthcare and the 2020 election in the era of coronavirus. Please visit us regularly at the Commonwealth Club, sorry, at commonwealthclub.org to stay informed on other programs on COVID-19 and other topics as well. By the way, these presentations are free. This program is generously supported by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and a collaborative of local funders and donors. We are grateful for their support and we encourage you to follow their example. You can go to our homepage and make a donation to support the series at the nonprofit Commonwealth Club, which we proudly say is the nation's oldest and largest public affairs forum. Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's featured guests. Dr. Bashara Shukair is Senior Vice President and Chief Health Officer at Kaiser Permanente. A member of the National Executive Team reporting directly to Kaiser's Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Shukair oversees the organization's efforts focused on addressing the social health of its 12.2 million members and the 68 million people who live in the communities it serves. His work includes the creation of the nation's largest social health network integrated with Kaiser Permanente's healthcare services to meet the housing, food, and transportation needs of its members. I'm also delighted to welcome Dr. Sandra Hernandez, the president and CEO of the California Healthcare Foundation, an $800 million foundation focused on improving the healthcare system for all Californians, and particularly those with low incomes. Earlier in her career, she co-chaired San Francisco's Universal Healthcare Council which designed Healthy San Francisco, the first time a local government in the United States attempted to provide health care for all of its constituents. And our third panelist is Peter Lee, the first executive director for Covered California, the state's health benefit exchange. Covered California is the largest, and many experts say the most successful, state-based Obamacare marketplace in the United States. Previously, Mr. Lee had various health care roles in the Obama administration, and was executive director of both the Pacific Business Group on Health and the Center for Healthcare Rights. Now, for our audience viewing via YouTube, we invite you to submit questions for our panelists. You can do so by adding questions to the comments. The club staff will forward them to me and I will try to integrate as many as possible into the program. And just before we get started, I wanna say that today is April 17th, 2020. That's important for those listening later via podcast or the radio because things are moving so very quickly. I just learned that yesterday, just yesterday, the U.S. saw 4,591 deaths due to COVID-19, which is the highest figure yet, according to Johns Hopkins University. That is sobering. But California has fared better than many states and much better than the worst initial estimates. So let's see what we can learn from these three California healthcare leaders. Bashar, I'm going to start with you. You're a medical doctor, but much of your background is in public health, and you are Kaiser Permanente's chief health officer. I think many of us think more about the medical side of all this because we have personal relations with doctors and hospitals. And we think more about that than public health, which is more abstract and distant. But I could argue that we really have a medical crisis that was precipitated, at least in part, because of the failure of our public health efforts. So, Given your expertise, how much of this COVID-19 problem is a public health problem rather than a medical system problem? And how can Kaiser, as a medical organization, address all the challenges that lie, be, you know, including but beyond the traditional medical issues? Well, thank you so much for hosting me, and Mark. It's great to be with you, Sandra and, um, um, and Peter. Um, and thank you for the Commonwealth Club for hosting this, uh, this event. And let me start by saying this pandemic is everyone's problem. It is a medical problem. It is a public health problem. It's a problem that's creating significant strain on our economy, 
Um, it's a problem that's creating significant strain on our society. Um, so let me start just briefly by uh, talking for a minute about the medical system. And I want to use that as an opportunity to give a big shout out to the tens of thousands of Kaiser Permanente healthcare workers who are on the front line, our doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists, uh, um, and other workforce who are out there taking care of our members and of our communities, um, as well as other healthcare workers um, across the country and the globe. Um, and to your point, this is a, health, a medical problem because we want to be able to step up and surge and be able to take care of the increase in number of people who are getting um, infected with COVID, uh, with, with the virus and, and having to deal with COVID-19. At the same time, we have to be thinking very carefully and working very closely with the public health community. Because if you think about it, a pandemic starts an, as an outbreak. And the way the public health community takes care of an outbreak is by doing, going to the roots of what public health is all about in this country and in the world. It's about identifying people who are infected very quickly, isolating those who are infected, quarantining those who are exposed, and doing contact tracing to identify more and more people who've been exposed and hopefully being able to isolate more of those who are infected. That's really the core of what the public health community's effort is about. And then when that fails, when you start having more and more communities spread, that's where really the healthcare system really needs to step up. Because when you have these types of spread in the community that you can't contain anymore, um, you really need to do all types of measures to slow the spread in the community so you can give time for your healthcare system to step up and be able to accommodate more people, in the case of COVID-19, be able to have enough ICU beds, ventilators, mm -hmm. and all of, that, uh, all of that other stuff. Meanwhile, the public health community is doing all these, this amazing work on social distancing efforts, closing schools, shelters in place, canceling events, to really slow that spread. So it's really about the public health community and the medical communities working side by side. But also, Mark, it is about the private sector stepping up for more PPE availability. It's about researchers identifying vaccines and treatment modalities. It's about public policy, making the right policies to mitigate the impact on people. So it really takes a village. It's everybody's problem, and everybody needs to be working hand, by hand, hand in hand to address this issue. And Kaiser Permanente is, is the big gorilla in California, certainly, particularly in Northern California, but with major other areas as well. And, and it's primarily a medical organization, but you're kind of in charge of the public health side. So what's, how's Kaiser managing that mix between public health and medical care? Well, the way I think of Kaiser Permanente, I look at us as a health organization. We deliver health care, but we're also, we also think about the overall picture of health in our communities. And we've, we've been now in existence for 75 plus years, and we've had the same mission since we were born as an organization, which is about making sure that we're improving the health and well-being of our members and those in our communities. And the fact that we have an integrated care delivery system allows us to really step up and be able to take care of our members and the communities where those members live in a way that no other fee-for-service health system could do that. And that's, I think, the significant added value that we bring to the table as an organization. We've been built, if you want, on the concept of really stepping up and pay attention to prevention. And now public health is really the ultimate prevention, if you want. And the fact that we are um, in this fight with others in the community, with the public health sector, the private sector, is a testament to our commitment to be able to making a difference. Sure. So, what's Kaiser been able to do because of its unique model that would be harder for that's harder for others to do related to this pandemic? Well, um, Mark, in response to the um, guidance that we've seen about shelter in place, our organization stepped up and it really stepped up our telehealth capabilities, and we've done telehealth services for a while now, but we've really stepped those up significantly. So now almost 80% of the care that's happening in an outpatient setting at Kaiser Permanente is happening pretty much virtually. You know, every day we're doing over 65,000 
virtual visits for our members so that our members can still stay at home, stay safe, respect the social distancing practices, including over 14,000 video visits every day. So that's one of the ways that we're supporting our members because we know our members need care and the ability for us to deliver that care virtually becomes critically important. Same thing for our pharmacy. Our mail-in pharmacies are significantly um, have increased. And again, this is great for our members to respect uh, social distancing, great for the environment, by the way, as well. And now more and more people are receiving their, mail, their pharmacy through mails. And like most other healthcare system, we've deferred many of our um, elective procedures um, down the line. And that's mostly to protect those members from having to be in the hospital, but also freeing up the hospital beds, freeing up our personal protective equipment to be used to take care of patients who have been diagnosed with COVID-19 and many, many more, but that's kind of the gist of it if you want, Mark. Right, thanks. Sandra, I wanna to go to you. You have kind of, a, in your job, you have a, a bird's eye view of, of things going on throughout California healthcare. What is unique about California that's relevant to this pandemic, both good and bad? Well, uh, first, Mark, nice to be with you and, and with all my colleagues today. Um, you know, I, I, everything Bashar said, I, I think, is quite true. What, what I think has been quite unique, though, about California is really how bold and how um, uh, data-driven uh, the uh, infrastructure has been to communicate the need to do something as extreme as community containment. I mean, it's been more than 100 years since community containment as a public health tool has been used at this scale. And today, a month into that, 85% of Californians, by and large, are supportive of all the actions that have been taken to date, notwithstanding the fact that COVID-19 has been incredibly disruptive for all kinds of reasons that are well known, no treatment, no vaccine, uh, and it's a virus that's so fascinating because it has this capability of transmitting infection without people having any symptoms whatsoever. So it is a very challenging virus. In the public health realm and as a state, which is very diverse, we're 40 million people, we're 58 different counties, we're incredibly ethnic diverse, we have a very large low income population, but the other thing you have to say about California is as you look at it, it has been the lead in the implementation of ACA, which I'm sure Peter will talk more about, but also in Medicaid expansion. So um, we don't yet have everybody covered, but I do think the fact that the vast majority of our population has insurance coverage is a significant advantage for us. We have a mechanism to communicate, and uh, communication is so important, transparency around what kind of decisions you're making and why, what kind of sacrifices you're asking people to make and why is really critically important, especially in the early days of managing a pandemic of this nature. So, so I would say that as the first. And the second would be, and Bashar alluded to this, the extraordinary outpouring of people who have stepped up to take whatever kind of medical training they have to come and be able to support the delivery system to do the surge planning necessary to make sure we didn't have people who needed ventilators and ICU beds and couldn't get them. Um, that was really the biggest goal. And to see the mobilization of the state, people who came out of retirement, volunteers, tremendous public-private partnerships, um, I think that is a very much a statement about how California operates. And it's one of the reasons I think people look at California and say, what have you done right? And I would say thus far, quite a few things. Right, thanks. We've well, got kind of a big picture view and a, and a more detailed view because the California Healthcare Foundation has been conducting a couple of uh, ongoing polls related to the epidemic, one aimed at, at residents and the other at physicians. So let's start with the, the general public. What have you found about the people in terms of their being tested? How many have had tests? How many think they need testing? How many are unable to get tests? And is that number getting, well, changing? I hope getting better if it's changing at all. 
Yeah, so we did a couple of ra rapid polls. We did it pretty much as a baseline to understand how we were progressing with testing, because of course testing is so important, again, as part of the, the tools in the toolbox to contain a pandemic. You really want to know who's infected, how much incidence of infection do you have, uh, really try to understand case fatality. So understanding testing is such an important part of the public health uh, toolkit. So we uh, did a quick poll to try to understand uh, how many people had been tested and how many people tried to get tested that weren't able to. And what we've seen is uh, first poll, it was very low, about 1%. And two weeks later, it was about 2% of people had been tested. Interestingly enough, we don't have a big demand of people who want to be tested who have not been able to. And that really is, a again, a testament to really good communication in messaging where we were trying to prioritize the use of tests as they became available. Keep in mind that in a month, a month's time, we went from having about two FDA-approved tests to today having more than 30 in a month. So testing is becoming more widely available. And we've got it first in the healthcare workforce and emergency rooms and people who have symptoms like it. And that's actually where you want to use testing when you have it originally. So the polling from residents would suggest that it's growing. More people are being tested over time. But it also suggests that the tests that we do have are being used in the right place. Right. And then the other piece really uh, it has to do with um, affordability. Um, and people having a sense of, you know, are you afraid to go and get care if you need care because of costs? And of course, that runs high anyways. People believe that healthcare is very expensive, co-pays are expensive, notwithstanding all the great work that uh, Peter has done at Covered California using subsidies and the like. So um, what you've seen though is a slight uptick in people's concern about if I go in to get care, am I gonna get a bill that I'm not gonna be able to uh, to pay or to cover. And there, there's a lot of confusion around uh, the CARE Act and what it covers and what it doesn't and what hospitals are going to do and is testing free. And so that message is very complicated to sort out for individuals. But I think overall, there's an uptick in anxiety anyways. And when you've got the kind of unemployment and the displacement of workers, that concern you can imagine is going to continue to rise. And it has a little bit over the time of the Great, right, thanks. You know, California is both the nation's wealthiest state and also has, by, I think, believe the highest poverty rate, which sounds counterintuitive, but we've proved in California you can somehow manage that. And I know that a lot of uh, what your foundation looks at is how the access uh, and, and the care quality for, for lower income Californians looks. Um, so Bashara mentioned that many, many or most visits at this point are uh, being done telephonically or over video or Zoom or Skype or yeah. something. What are you finding about changes in physician visits in that regard? And do you see a difference in the change between you know, all Californians and low-income Californians? Yeah, um, I, I think I completely agree with Bashar. I mean, Kaiser has been doing a lot of virtual care for a very long time, arguably the leader in the field. But there's been a lot of obstacles to the expansion of telemedicine, including not allowing it to be paid at current rates, a lot of payment uh, disincentives, a uh, lot of uh, regulatory obstacles. And what you've seen with this pandemic, in my view, is simply the telemedicine and telehealth genie is out of the bottle. Everybody converted to telemedicine and telehealth as quickly as they possibly could technically. Um, important to do for all the reasons Bashar said that I would not repeat, but essentially for safety of the workforce, for people to be able to maintain shelter at home. And the um, the uh, CMS has widely opened up Medicare reimbursement for telehealth now. The Department of Healthcare Services in California has done the same. The Department of Insurance has done the same. So what you've seen is um, now that people are going to be compensated for it, we're seeing what the tremendous capability there is for that. And important to realize for people who are low income, and if you're low income and you have a child with some chronic disease and you live in some rural county in North, Northern California and you need to get to UCSF to see a specialist, to be able to have telehealth and telemedicine work 
uh, for you and not have to take a day off and not have to drive your car and not to have to put your kid in the car. I mean, it really creates tremendous capabilities for people who are very low income and fundamentally shifts where we're providing care. We're now providing care in communities, in people's homes, in their living rooms. And that really from a overall affordability of the system means where we currently spend a lot of dollars building facilities, we really should be thinking about how do we use our workforce fully and use telemedicine as a vehicle to reach people, including people who are very low income. Yeah, yeah, that's great, well, thanks. Peter, I wanna to turn to you. Uh, obviously covered California being a large, a large uh, a payer, a, a, a group that covers a lot of Californians. Um, I know that as a result of this pandemic, you've reopened enrollment to serve re residents who've recently become unemployed or have different needs or whatever. So could you tell us who's eligible, who isn't, how affordable is the coverage and what's the deadline for people to get this coverage? Yeah, great. So thank you very much again. I'm thrilled to be here with my colleagues and also with the Commonwealth Club. A uh, couple of things that Sandra noted that are so important to note about what's different about California. Uh, today in the pandemic, one of the things is that eight years ago, California said, we're gonna use all the tools of the Affordable Care Act, uh, which a lot of that is around coverage expansion. The biggest thing is expanding the Medicaid program, but also developing Cover California to be a marketplace for people that needed a financial leg up could get private plans. Uh, now, this has been never, as important as today when so many millions of people are not only economically insecure, but insecure about their health status. So uh, we actually opened our doors wide open, even though as a normal course of business, if you lose your job and lose insurance, we're open year round. Otherwise we have a special open enrollment period. But we decided to have what's called a special enrollment period for COVID because there were some people that might've been uninsured three months ago, and you know, be very good health, but now be worried about the pandemic and want to sign up. We want to get them in the door uh, because it's a public health measure. You want people that are at risk to get coverage, so they go see that primary care doctor, they get tested. Um, it's also equity, the right thing to do. So we've now been open about three weeks into a special enrollment period that we've decided in California will go all the way through at least the end of June. And this is one of the things I appreciate about the state of California is. Governor Newsom's been in, done an incredible job of from months ago saying, we're going to look at the facts, look at the evidence, and act based on those facts and evidence. We know, sadly, this pandemic won't be gone in June. It'll change course, change shape. So our having the special enrollment period at least through June is part of the California approach. Now, what have we seen? Uh, almost 60,000 people sign up for coverage through us. But we know many times that signing up for Medicaid, uh, Medi-Cal in California. So it really is back to Sandra's point. California, by putting investments in a delivery system and in coverage, it's not quite everybody. Undocs aren't all covered. But we have in California a different world than people are seeing in much of the country where you have 20% uninsured and people that are losing jobs in Texas and Florida are not only losing income but they're now being thrown out into the world, being very insecure about their health status. Mm -hmm. So everybody, in a sense, is eligible at some level, and some people actually get subsidies, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. So Tell us a little bit about sort of affordability. Yeah, so it, the, the, one of the great things about the Affordable Care Act is your financial help is tiered based on your income. You make less money, you get more financial help. If you're very low income, you get Medi-Cal, which is free. And now in California, one third of Californians under the age of 65 are in Medi-Cal. These are good plans. They're Kaiser's in the program. We got Blue Shield. They're managed care plans that have local initiatives, range of options that are providing really good care. Then at Covered California, you make more than say 30,000 a year. You may get virtually all of your healthcare premium paid by a subsidy. But we actually added in California this year a state subsidy. One of the things the Affordable Care Act did was say, if you make 400% of poverty, which is about $100,000 for a family of four. You make one penny more than that, you won't get any financial help. That's under the federal law. Governor Newsom and the legislature said, you know, no, it's, we had older Californians across the state paying 20, 30% of their income for health insurance premium. We expanded this year with middle-class subsidies. 
So now you can make up to 600% of poverty. That's 150,000 a year for a family of four and get state financial help depending on your age and what healthcare is gonna cost you. And this really comes back to the philosophy this state has had, which is we wanna leave no one behind. Mm -hmm. um, and it really is a commitment that is pretty much across the political spectrum of yeah, healthcare is a right. We want everyone to have healthcare and not have financial burdens or impediments for you getting coverage or access to care. And I really just wanna build on one of the things Sandra said, because it's a very important point that telehealth, it's a wonderful system, but under the general system for telehealth, and we've been tracking telehealth for the 11 plans we contract with for seven years, all of them offer telehealth, but for some there's co-pays, some there's not co-pays, so those differ a lot. And for a doctor, whether or not they get paid the same varies incredibly. What we've done in California, and this is to the credit of our um, insurance regulators, Department of Managed Healthcare, is to say during this pandemic, you health plan must pay every doctor for that televisit the same as if that visit were in person. Now, why is that important? Now, if you're Kaiser, you're paid to serve a population. It makes financial and healthcare sense to do telehealth. But if you're a small group or a large group that relies on fee for service and you aren't paid for a televisit, many of those practices are dying right now. They are struggling because they're having huge drops of paid service. People aren't getting in the doors. And our state said access isn't just about premiums. It's about how you pay providers and giving them a reason that doctors will have open doors for telehealth. Great, thanks. And that leads me to another question I'll ask Bashar, and that is that, uh, a lot of groups are, a lot of, of care is being deferred, right? So fortunately, Kaiser, if you're doing good telehealth, you're not deferring that many primary care visits or as many as you would otherwise, but you're still just deferring elective procedures in the hospital, right, which are substantial. So maybe I should ask you generally about your plan for reopening facilities when that's uh, available, kind of what you've called the suppression phase of the pandemic. And I'm particularly curious, are you expecting a surge in demand for people who've delayed these elective procedures? Well, th thank you for uh, for bringing up this question. It was such an important question. I think our, messages to, our message to our members has always been uh, throughout these shelter in place orders, we're here for you. We're gonna try to accommodate as much as you need by telehealth. You can call us, you can schedule a video conference with us. You can come to see us if you need to in one of our facilities. But like most other healthcare systems in this country, we did defer um, elective procedures uh, uh, down the line, just so that we make sure we are ready when we have a surge and an uptick in number of people having COVID-19 who need that hospital bed, who need that ventilator in the ICU, um, and honestly also for our healthcare workers who might need that personal protective equipment to use to deal with patients with COVID. Um, so we're trying to accommodate as much as we can through telehealth at this point, some through in-person visits. Um, and the plan now is thinking through together with the state and with other healthcare systems in the country, in the community and the public health community, what would it look like to move to the next phase of dealing with the pandemic? You know, I, I think, Mark, what we know about pandemic, we've learned from previous pandemics. And, you know, usually an outbreak starts and you want to focus on containing it. Um, clearly, we couldn't contain this, this, uh, this outbreak before it became a pandemic. The community spread became so, so high. Uh, we had to shift into mitigation stages. We put the non-pharmaceutical interventions by advancing social distancing. We closed schools, did all these measures that are so critical, and we given ourselves, the country and our healthcare system, an opportunity to step up and be able to respond to the, the increased demand. Now, what we're seeing, all these measures, exactly to what Sandra has described, are actually paying off. And particularly here in California, we're seeing this flattening of the curve, if you want, which is a great sign um, for our healthcare system to be able to respond, but also a great sign for people living, um, living in this country, and particularly here in California. Now, as the rate of new infection starts going down, then we need to shift our thinking to start thinking about how do we suppress this pandemic? That's kind of like the third phase, if you want, of the pandemic. So you have the containment, 
you hit, once containment fail, you go into mitigation. Once mitigation pays off and you see flattening of the curve and the number of cases go down, then you have to shift into suppressing this virus down the line. And that goes back to the same core public health principles of doing broad testing and the ability to isolate those who are infected, quarantine those who are exposed, and doing a lot of contact tracing. And at the same time, as we start doing that, we have to be thinking together with the rest of the healthcare system, what would it take to reopen if you want the healthcare system? What would it take to make sure that we still have as a community enough capacity in case we've seen more surges? The reality is we're likely gonna see more surges down the line. We're hoping they're not gonna be nearly as severe as the first round, but we will potentially see surges. So we wanna make sure before we reopen the healthcare system as a country, and here in California and each one of our communities, that we've maintained the capacity to be able to surge up very quickly and be able to accept and deal with patients who are dealing with COVID-19, who are gonna need those extra beds, those extra ventilators, extra ICU beds, and we'd want to make sure that we have good, solid plan and supplies of personal protective equipment because we do want to make sure that we're protecting our frontline workers. Um, and unless we have these plans and systems in place and really solid, it's going to be hard for us to be successful at suppressing this pandemic in this next phase. Right. So Mark, I'm, Mark, if I could just jump in here, you, you asked a question about Kaiser, and it's a big delivery system with a lot of facilities. Yeah. And, and Peter mentioned the impact on some of the smaller medical groups. But there's another part of our delivery system that we shouldn't lose sight of, which are rural hospitals who are standalone hospitals, don't have a lot of reserve. And those facilities are very much at risk of really being lost as part of this pandemic. It, they don't have the flexibility of having numerous facilities where you can move beds and use different sor sources in different places in your facilities. They don't tend to have those kinds of reserves. And um, so even as hospitals that have big delivery systems and, and are part of a big system, as they think about how to come back online and do things that are quote unquote elective, although elective today is, might be chemotherapy, it might be a coronary procedure, it might be a valve replacement, it, it, it's not elective in the sense of plastic surgery. So I do think one of the things we have to do when we get into a more normative state of our delivery system is assess really what we lost in capacity, particularly for parts of our state that doesn't have good access today. And I worry in particular about small rural hospitals being able to survive this economic downturn and the impact on their hospitals and those communities. Yeah, it's an important point. And although I think some rural communities are seeing a lower incidence of COVID-19, not all are, but that could be just because it'll get there later. <laughs> You know, right, and because we don't have as much testing there yet either, right? So yeah. and we're in social distancing and we've had great compliance with that and that's work. But as we begin to loosen that, which inevitably will happen, those are the kinds of things I think we need to continue to monitor very closely. Great, yeah. And, so and Mark, and yeah. Mark I, I can't agree more with, uh, with Sandra. This is such an important piece. Um, and on top of that, I also worry about um, a few vulnerable groups in our communities. I'm particularly concerned about what's happening in shelters, what's happening for our homeless population who are struggling and how to deal with this pandemic on top of the stress and struggles of living on the streets. And I also worry about the skilled nursing facilities and nursing homes that are really, you know, they, they have the most vulnerable in our communities and we have to be able to support these facilities, support them with PPE and others, um, um, other protocols and others to make sure that we are able to suppress the, the pandemic. Because there's no way we're gonna be able to suppress the pandemic if we're not paying attention to those who are most vulnerable. And I appreciate um, Sandra's re referral to the hospitals in, in rural communities. I think we also need to pay attention, close attention to the homeless population, um, the skilled nursing facilities and others um, as key part of, of uh, suppressing this pandemic. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think California 
did well in being out front and having one of the, I guess the earliest state to shelter in place fully in the Bay Area was even a little bit ahead of that. So I think that, that's helped us a great deal. And uh, next week's program, we'll focus on the more vulnerable among us uh, and also how that affects everybody because of course, it doesn't really matter who gets sick. If somebody's getting sick and isn't getting treated, they can infect everyone regardless of, 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 of who they are and whether, you, whether you're covered for insurance or something. But I did want to go back to something that you were uh, talking about, Bashar, and that is let's say that I'm a, 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 well, don't have to be a Kaiser member. Let's say I have an elective, and, and Sandra, maybe it's more accurate to call the non-urgent procedure, something that can yeah. wait. Better, <laughs> right? better um, said. Okay, and now a month and a half from now, it, I'm, able, uh, I'm able to go back in, okay? Uh, I assume everybody who a month and a half from now would have needed the procedure is still going to need it then, right? Plus all the people who've been waiting for a while. So you have this big bolus at the same time. Uh, Bashar, if you could comment on this, I, I, it, maybe things are different. Maybe you need to space out patients more physically or by distance. Maybe you need to test everybody and that takes more time. Maybe you have fewer uh, staff members to do it. So is it possible we're going to have more demand and less supply at the same time in a few months? Well, this is exactly where we're spending a lot of time right now as an organization is trying to look at what the next few weeks and few months are going to look like. Um, and that's going to have to be built on what are we learning from our modeling that we're seeing? How, and, and honestly, it's going to really depend on what's going to happen to this curve. Are we really kind of keeping that curve flat? Are we crushing that curve? Are we going to see spikes down the line? So it's going to require a lot of really detailed planning with the idea that you'd want to really be able to catch up eventually on everything that you've deferred. So a lot of planning is happening along those lines right now. Well, obviously very important. And I know that at this point, uh, um, according to the University of Washington data, California has hit or just maybe passed its peak uh, for this round. And we hope, we hope that's true. And I know that along the way, we've been trying to get enough equipment, PPE and so forth in. How is Kaiser doing with having sufficient PPE today and over the next month or so? Yeah, so we do have the appropriate PPE that we need to uh, protect our workforce. Um, and just like many other um, healthcare systems across the country, we've modified our protocols so that we can preserve um, those personal protective equipment as much as we can. We've worked very closely with the CDC um, on their guidelines, we've translated their guidelines on day-to-day -day, um, operations for our health system. Um, so, and we are actively engaged in making sure that our supply chain is as aggressive as possible in obtaining more and more uh, personal protective equipment. And, and I wanna use this opportunity to highlight some of the innovations that we've seen around uh, personal protective equipment. You know, in, in one of our regions in KP Washington, we've partnered with a, um, a, uh, a Seattle area Westland distillery, for example, mm -hmm. to, to create um, um, sanitizers. A distillery made sanitizers and we've got 25 or so gallons or even more of sanitizers that way. Um, here in the Bay Area, one of our uh, pediatrician, Dr. Rosen, uh, together with her friend, Regina Sackhalls, uh, partnered together to design a prototype for a face shield that ended up partnering with um, with Apple and created uh, lots of face shields that's supporting our um, um, uh, the protection of, of our workforce and others across the country. Uh, we've partnered with Microsoft and UPS and the American Hospital Organization, American Hospital Association, and we've launched a new effort um, called um, a, a new effort to really match people and organizations who want to donate uh, PPE with hospitals who have the most need for PPE. And, and we've launched this effort earlier this week. So I think we're seeing lots of the ingenuity, if you want, and the innovation of what this country can bring and people in this country can bring. And we have to continue to double down on this um, as we continue to fight this pandemic. Great, thanks. I'm seeing the kind of cooperation and, and the spirit that Sandra was talking about. Well, Mark, on the PPE issue, it's just important to realize that all countries are looking for PPE. And it's not just hospitals who need PPE now, right? You need, prisons need to have it. Um, you need to have it, you know, we were talking about doing isolation after we do contact tracing. 
you put people in isolation, if they can't isolate at home, you're going to have to put them somewhere. Again, you'll need masks to be able to do that. So the PPE demand is an enormous one, and it's not just in hospitals where we're going to need to have it in order to continue to contain this virus. Yeah, that's a great point. I hope that we've ramped up or are ramping up sufficiently so we'll be able to meet that demand going forward. I should say that for anybody who's just joined us, you're listening to the Commonwealth Club where we're discussing the COVID-19 pandemic with Kaiser Permanente Senior Vice President and Chief Health Officer, Bashara Shukar, California Healthcare Foundation CEO, Sandra Hernandez, and Covered California Executive Director, Peter Lee. And Peter, I'm gonna jump to you here. Um, I read an analysis by Covered California, which found that commercial health insurers costs related to this pandemic could range from anywhere between 34 billion and 250 billion this year. Mm -hmm. But of course, physician practices and even hospitals, as we've heard, are seeing such a drop in overall demand that many are laying off staff, which really is unprecedented. So why wouldn't there be a net savings to the healthcare system with more spent on COVID, but so much less spent than everything else in California or nationally? Yeah, two things. Uh, great question. It does relate to your question about a uh, drop in other demand. Um, we did this study uh, 300 years ago, as in in March. Uh, <laughs> time changes very quickly. And, and uh, in the high, medium, and low, the high estimates were what might happen if the efforts to um, flatten the curve didn't work. Good news is they've worked. But if they hadn't worked, we could easily have been spending nationally in the commercial market $250 billion, which would be 20% increase over what we would have spent otherwise, 20%. Um, we're still gonna spend a lot on COVID, uh, likely in the mid range, which might be in the neighborhood of $100 billion in direct spending on COVID. Um, now, if that were only added to our healthcare expense, that would be about a 10% add on that wasn't planned or budgeted for. It's absolutely clear there are huge reductions in care. Um, and we've been talking to a lot of our plans, including Kaiser, but others, about how much of a drop. And we're seeing drops of from 10, 15, 25% of what the cost would have been otherwise because uh, not occurring because of elective procedures, people not going, and also things that right now none of us quite understand, such as fewer strokes, fewer heart attacks. Heart attacks aren't elective, you don't think, um, but in some areas they're seeing fewer of them. Um, we don't really know, uh, and we're doing a lot of work right now with our health plans to project what is this going to look like for the balance of 2020 and for 2021, because right now, every plan across America is starting to think about what will this be in 2021? What do we need to price for? And will 2021 be a year where we've got continued COVID that we're dealing with with smaller ups and downs? and a bolus of care unprovided in 2020 coming back? Or is it gonna be similar in terms of a standard year for issues of cancer, diabetes, et cetera? These are very big questions. And I think part of our job at Cover California is to not think we got the right answers, but make sure we're answering, uh, asking the right questions. Uh, yeah. And we know there's a lot of uncertainty. We need to narrow that uncertainty as much as possible. So. Okay. And, uh you have been quite outspoken in urging the federal government to take some action to prevent large spikes in premiums next year. Of course, there's lots of uncertainty, but many people may not be aware how far in advance a lot of those premiums have to be set. So you used to work in the federal government. Uh, what would you tell the federal government to do? Well, two things. I mean, one thing is uh, it, it's striking that California and about a dozen other states declared special enrollment periods. The first thing, forget planning for down the, down the road, we need to make sure people that are insecure and need financial access to care can get in today. Uh, the federal government, which actually runs marketplaces for 35 states, has not declared a special enrollment period. Uh, I still don't understand that. I mean, that's, that's a, on the federal level, opening the doors for people that don't have insurance, it's good for public health, it's good economics, because most of the people coming in will not get COVID. They're worried well, bringing them in good economics as well as good public health. So that's number one. Number two, we really should be going back to what was part of the original Affordable Care Act, which is called reinsurance. These are programs that actually help the individual market cover big costs that aren't planned for. Uh, it's a core design of the Affordable Care Act that was time limited, but that would give health plans certainty in planning for 2021 to say that we're going to cover a portion of your costs. And because of that, you can lower premiums for everybody. 
The third thing I commend the federal policymakers to do is what California started on the path of doing this last year, expanding subsidies. I want to be clear, affordability, even with the subsidies there, lower income people still struggle and middle income people are left out. Um, the, the fourth thing that I'd note, and this is something that Sandra alluded to, which is so important. You know, we often talk about covered California, the individual market and Medi-Cal, but remember, half of Californians and half of Americans uh, get their coverage through their employer. Now, a lot of that coverage is really good coverage, rich coverage, wide benefits, but about a third of the people with employer-based coverage uh, get two things that really are not good equations for good health. Number one, uh, they're in high deductible plans. They have big deductibles, which means they are scared to go to the doctor because they think they've got to foot the whole bill. We don't want people to be scared from going to the doctor. We want someone, if they're worried about having COVID, to see a doctor to get a check. You got a high deductible plan, you're discouraged from getting care. The other thing that's a problem with the employer-based designs is they aren't adjusted for income. Someone making $20,000 working in the same company as someone making $300,000 gets the same premium support to buy healthcare. That's just cuckoo math and bad public health. So these are some of the policy issues that need to be addressed that aren't just individual market issues. They're dysfunction in a healthcare system that doesn't recognize that income matters and getting people into care means removing financial barriers that shouldn't be there in the first place. Okay. Well, we'll see if this makes an impact uh, on the long, long term in the healthcare system. Uh, Sandra, I want to go back to you for a moment. Uh, you know, we hear a lot about the availability of testing and we've talked about PPE and so forth. And uh, the Trump administration has said that there's a lot. Some critics say that there's not. You actually went out and asked doctors in California, <laughs> do you have enough tests for yourselves or other healthcare colleagues? And do you have enough PPE? So what are the doctors directly on the front lines saying? Yeah, we particularly wanted to understand what our safety net providers were experiencing. And so it was really important in our very first poll, our safety net providers were concerned about being able to get access to PPE. And remember, this was a, uh, you know, it was sort of a fend for yourself, non-coordinated approach to PPE. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, one hospital system uh, leader said to me they had 520 vendors that they were trying to procure PPE from. Um, and so in the safety net providers and in our federally qualified health centers, for example, they're competing in that kind of marketplace. So in the first poll, that was certainly a concern. And what we saw nicely from poll to poll, that is over the, um, the last two that we did, is that that stress about PPE is starting to get a little better among our safety net providers, which of course is a really uh, an important sign. Because we're asking people to go take care of patients in very unusual circumstances with very high stress, and then not really sure um, whether you're gonna have the PPE that you need to be able to provide to your workforce. So some improvement in that, but certainly the smaller purchasers competing with bigger purchasers in a very chaotic environment. And hospitals that had PPE, for example, uh, up to a month's supply are now into two and three days and waiting for these vendors to come through. So um, I, I do think our safety net providers are always at a disadvantage there, even while they're going and serving the populations that they've always served. So overall, I would say improvement. Well, improvement's good. I, uh, about two weeks ago, got a call from a friend of mine who lives in China and said, by the way, you need any N95 masks? I said, yes. So he, he said, uh, uh, well, you know, I, I got a friend who's got some. I said, well, how many? I thought he'd say like a dozen. He said, oh, we can get, you know, thousands. Well, my wife works, as you know, Sandra, at, a, at the uh, county hospital in Oakland, Highland Hospital. And uh, I know that her hospital needed some. So I put her hospital in touch with them. I felt pretty good about it for a moment. And then I thought, wait a minute, what am I doing managing the international supply chain? This doesn't seem like the way that, that the, the healthcare system should work. Well, not only that, not only that, Mark, but the price gouging that was associated with that. I mean, people used to buy these masks for 10 cents, and now they're paying $6 for yeah, a mask. Yeah, I mean, that's work. just an extraordinary cost that we're seeing that's being built into this um, uh, disrupted supply chain. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think that one of the challenges of anybody who works in public health is to 
notify and inform the public sufficiently so that they are sufficiently concerned about the threat, but not get them so scared that they panic and riot or just o overreact overall. And um, I was thinking about that when I looked at the most recent data from your survey and found it very concerning, but not completely dire. <laughs> Is that a fair characterization of what you're finding? You know, I, I think it's, I think, um... What I would say, and Peter alluded to this, and I would echo it, I think that the California, what you have seen is that people have been very patient. Patient would be the word I would use. And that is to say, they understand this virus does, can take people into an ICU and get them ventilated in a very fast way. And that there is no herd immunity and we don't have any vaccine and don't yet have any treatment. Um, but what I do think has been very well done is uh, by the, the Newsom administration and an amazing team of people that he has around him, which is they're looking at the modeling, and modeling is only as good as the data you put in it. So getting really good data, communicating really well with the counties, very important because that's where things are actually happening. And then really being very clear about why you're making the decisions that you're making. And I think that that is, has really borne out quite well so that people are not panicked. And think about it. What in California does 85% of the population ever do or agree upon? I mean, it's really quite extraordinary. And I think that is both a sense of hope I mean, when he did his health corps on the first day, 25,000 people came and said, here, I'll help. I'll come back from retirement or I'm a paramedic. I'll come and do this. And so it, it has been really, I think, an amazingly good communication effort. And in pandemics, what you need to do is be honest. You need to be factual. You need to be consistent and you need to be totally transparent. And I think that's what's gone well in California, as well as being willing to make bold decisions to use the tools of public health as drastic as they are to not see the kind of thing that we were trying to avert. And so, you know, the challenge now, Mark, will be, as with prevention always, is what you don't see. People say, well, then nothing happened. Well, that's exactly what you want, right, was for nothing to happen. And so what you don't want is people to go, well, you know, there are people dying, the hospitals aren't overloaded, and so what's the big deal? And so that's the risk. So what I say is thus far, people have been very patient, the communication's been very transparent, and decisions have been made based on data. And when you're in a pandemic, even if you don't have all the facts, you have to tell people the facts you don't have. But you also have to tell people why you're making the decisions that you are. And I think that the California leadership has done an extraordinarily good job of that. Great, thanks. Bashar, I want to ask you, uh, uh, we, we, we spend a lot of time worrying, uh, of course, for the COVID-19 about the impact on the lungs and people dying and so forth. Um, but something that maybe gets less attention is mental health. And it's, uh, my sister's a therapist on the East Coast, and she said her business is way up. She's not happy about that, but it's way up. Um, what are you seeing at Kaiser about mental health, and what can we do during this time to help support mental health, which typically is underserved even in the best of times? Yeah, so th thank you for bringing up this question. And even from our own internal survey for our own members, we're realizing that there is an uptick in uh, people's having to deal with the mental health implications of this pandemic. And, and uh, we're seeing that in polls across the country. Um, so at Kaiser Permanente, what we've done is we've transitioned the overwhelming majority of our uh, mental health services to become on uh, 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 virtual. So we're, we're almost 90% of our counseling services are delivered through telehealth at this point. We've also um, made available on our um, KP app or the, the kp.org website um, additional virtual resources to support people dealing with stress and dealing with anxiety, being able to deal with the social isolation. So there are multiple um, digital tools that we've made available to our members free of charge. And we have to step up as a country because this is going to be the mental health implications of this pandemic 
is going to be pretty significant. And I think now we're all uh, making sure that we're not catching COVID-19, but as this pandemic settles down and we get it suppressed, it's going to be really important that we pay attention to the mental health needs of, of people in this country overall. Yeah. Sandra, I believe you, you also surveyed Californians about it. Are we seeing a worsening of mental health? It is getting a little bit worse, poll over poll. It's also a little worse among women, uh, interestingly, if you, if you break up the poll by respondents, male and female. Um, there seems to be increasing stress among women, and you can understand that because you have a lot of women who are homeschooling their kids. They don't have childcare. Uh, if they can work, they're working from home and juggling those kinds of circumstances. And if you're very low income and you're a woman or a grandmother and um, whoever was making any money in the household is now not, um, you can imagine that those financial pressures are going to add to, uh, to the stress that we're seeing in the polls. And it doesn't surprise me that we're seeing it more so in women than in men. And it is something I think we are definitely going to want to continue to track over the uh, over this period? Well, fortunately, something I've, I've heard pretty consistently uh, is that uh, Zoom uh, or Skype or video mental health visits seem to work uh, as, at least as well as the physical health visits. So, telepsych is something that the California Healthcare Foundation, we've been trying to do telemedicine, telehealth for many years. And in the past, it was very much focused on trying to get access to specialists that are few and far between, of which psychiatry is certainly one. And so telepsychiatry is something that has been around for a while, again, constrained by fee-for-service and regulatory and what gets paid and what doesn't. Um, and so absolutely. And there are, you know, apps that are people are using to be able to do it. But, but I think it's also important to recognize, as you said earlier in the program, Mark, we have a large population of low-income people. And as long as the economics are so distorted by virtue of what we have to do from a public health point of view, you can well imagine that um, stress, <laughs> even the dogs are getting more stressed. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, 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 is a, it, is a, it is a real concern uh, that as uh, the economic pressures continue to grow and paychecks stop and jobs will not come back uh, like the flip of a switch, and so I, I do think the demand for psychiatry and for social work and for mental health support is going to continue to grow. And the, the good thing is that telepsych is a good solution to that. Yeah, great. Peter, I have a question for you, but first you have to tell us the name of your dog. Uh, Gilly, right over my shoulder there, and I, I should have left her in another room, but she's been good up till now. <laughs> she's been pretty good. That's okay. You know, you, you mentioned you, uh, the, uh, some things about the government and benefit design, and you, you maybe implied but didn't say outright that California, Cover California does require benefit designs that make sure that when people have deductibles, it, they don't discourage them from getting basic drugs or going to the doctor's office. So that's something that you have. And you don't have a health plan. You've got a marketplace of health plans, but you can influence those health plans. What, so I assume that's, we, we, we assume that that's probably had a, a, good, a good impact on your, on your members, uh, on, the, on the plans members. Um, how else can you or have you tried to influence consumer behavior during this pandemic through benefit design Great. or other way? Well, well, first, I want to describe what you noted, because you're sort of familiar with the mark, but most people listening probably aren't, is that for most people, when you have a deductible, it's a deductible means you need to pay that bill entirely up to a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars before insurance kicks in. What we have at Covered California for virtually all of our plans, and they're identical benefit designs, whether you buy with Kaiser or Blue Shield or Anthem or Health, identical. So consumers aren't shopping based on benefit designs they don't understand. But every one of the designs says for most of the products that deductibles don't apply for outpatient care which means you want to go see a doctor for a mental health visit, your primary care doc, it's first dollar coverage. It's not a barrier. That's not how standard designs are in the employer world. It's not how most other marketplaces work. It's the right kind of design. Um, so a couple of things that we've been doing, and number one, and this is where I sort of uh, think that we got it right seven years ago. So like California Healthcare Foundation has been looking at telehealth for quite a while. We've been pushing our plans to have telehealth. And the fact that not just Kaiser, but every one of our other 10 health plans now has thousands and thousands of televisits happening every day is because of work done years ago. 
being ready for a pandemic isn't just a public health issue. It's a benefit design issue. It's a delivery system issue. It's having the right networks. And I feel very good about what our plans are doing. Every one of them in reaching out to support their docs, not as well integrated as Kaiser, without a doubt, but reaching out to make sure they can get telehealth. They've been providing tools to their doctors to support uh, care virtually. Uh, they've been reaching out to patients. You know they've got access, whether you're an integrated system or not integrated. But the other piece that I know that we've been doing, which is, again, right now, uh, you know, we have a tsunami of concern around, around COVID. But the one that's following beyond that, which is going to last longer, is the economic impacts of this recession. So some of the things we've been doing to that end is we have, sadly, millions of unemployment checks going out in California starting this month. Every single one of those checks is going to come with an envelope uh, that talks about Cover California and how to get insurance coverage. And this is, again, our state has been ready to turn on a dime, not just to make sure the fir first responders, whether it's a doctor or a nurse, has good protective uh, uh, equipment on, but also we've had the infrastructure so if people lose insurance, they've got a place to go. And so we've been going thinking on both of those tracks, but it's part of things that don't happen overnight. You aren't ready to state overnight for a pandemic. Rather, you have systems infrastructure in place that can then be ramped up. And if they're ramped up well, you have a better response as we've seen here in California. Great. Well, thanks for that, Peter. I also want to say kudos to you because I know you've been involved with Covered California from the start, and our state has done a lot of things right uh, with that marketplace that really have paid off. So thank thanks. you for that. I'm sorry to say that we've now reached the point in our program where there's time for only one last question, especially since there's three of you, and I want to give you each a shot at it, a short shot at it. But here's the question. Uh, what is one lesson, good or bad, that other states can learn from California's experience with this pandemic? And Bashar, we're gonna start with you. Sure, um, um, I have to say, I think for me to see our public health officers in the Bay Area stepping up so early before anybody else in the country make those decisions and put these distancing measures in place, to see them step up, the six of them in the Bay Area and say, based on the data that we have, based on what we know needs to happen, here's what needs to happen and have the courage to do that makes me a proud, uh, proud resident in, their, uh, in the Bay Area here. And as a former health officer, to see that work happening with this courage just made me so proud being part of the state. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. Sandra, we'll have you go next. Well, you know, Mark, maybe I'll end with a, a what I, I view is so incredibly unique about California, which is that we have a very robust not-for-profit sector. We have a very robust philanthropic sector. Bashar talked about the leadership in our, in our public health departments. And just a, maybe a preamble to your next program. Um, Santa Clara was an early hotspot and has a very large homeless population. And today, every individual who's unsheltered in Santa Clara County has been tested, and if they're tested positive, they have been housed. They have put uh, sanitizers and uh, hand washing capabilities. They've done mobile health. And really, um, you know, we think of homelessness as such an intractable situation. And yet when we recognize that it's all of our best interest to make sure that we take care of our most vulnerable, to me, that is the statement that is most powerful about California. The governor two days ago said he was gonna put some money to make sure that people who are undocumented but pay taxes and work here will get some benefits and the philanthropic community matched it. This is the kind of public, private, civic life that we have in California and it makes me feel good about being here and being part of the solution. Great, thank you. Peter, what can other states learn from the way that California has responded to the pandemic? So a couple of things. One, number one, California sort of has a reputation as being a blue state. But what I look at what California's done, it's been, it's responded to this epidemic, not as a political issue, which comes back to how we responded to the Affordable Care Act. My organization was launched with a Republican governor uh, establishing a marketplace because it was the right policy. We have a governor in a state that has said, let's not play politics, let's be driven by facts, let's be driven by evidence. And as Sandra noted, let's have systems that support everybody in this state, whether you're homeless, undocumented, lower income, higher income, and that approach, it's good policy, good public health, 
and it's why we got out ahead of this epidemic because we've been thinking those in those terms for 10 years. Great, thanks. That's great, but before we close, I wanna remind you all to visit us regularly at commonwealthclub.org to stay informed about other programs in the club's ongoing series on COVID-19 done in association with the Zetima Project. Next, you can join us on Friday, this coming Friday at 2 p.m. Pacific time for pandemic healthcare inequities and how they affect everyone. And also on May 4th uh, at uh, noon to hear Kaiser Family Foundation CEO Drew Altman discuss U.S. healthcare and the 2020 election in the era of coronavirus. Now I want to give a big thank you to our panelists, Bashar Shukair, Sandra Hernandez, and Peter Lee for joining us virtually today for the Commonwealth Club program. Thanks also to the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and to our other donors. If you enjoyed this program, I encourage you to make a donation yourself. We'd really appreciate it. I'm Mark Zitter of the Zetima Project, and now this virtual program of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. <laughs>